A very good morning to all of you. I welcome you all to Ansarkari and I hope that you all must be doing fine. So let's start with today's analysis, which is going to be for 28th of February 2023. So we'll be looking into an ancient stupa which surfaces in Odisha and need to reimagine signs. So we saw heavy and peaceful polling in Meghalaya and Nagaland. So, talking about the voter turnout, so it turned out to be 85.32% in Nagaland and 77.55% in Meghalaya. So, Supreme Court, it reacted sharply on Monday that it is not concerned with the politics when the government claimed that the opposition to the piecemeal tenure extensions granted to the enforcement directorate directors is uh, like by members of the political parties trying to subvert the ongoing investigations against their leaders and went to the Supreme Court. Uh, in 2021, it had like specifically said that there would be no further extensions for Mr. Mishra. But despite that, government has provided him with an extension. And we saw that within two months of the judgment, uh, basically made amendments to the Central Vigilance Commission Act by way of promulgation of an ordinance in November 2021. So on the one hand, we are seeing that wheat prices are on the rise. And on the other hand, the onion price cuts, they have produced tears for the Gujarat farmers. And so we've been like facing the cereal inflation, which is a cause of concern for us. So Prime Minister inaugurates the Shiv Moga Airport. And here you need to know about the Udan scheme that we have, which stands for Ude Desh Ka Aam Nagrik. And it is basically a regional connectivity scheme which connects different airports and makes the air travel cost-friendly. So the airport, that it is there in Karnataka. And so we've been like seeing an expansion of different like airports in different states across India. So you, you need to be aware about caste census and which all states are like conducting one and should it be at the national level or not. So talking about the new set of e-waste rules, the burgeoning problem of managing the e-waste is a cross-cutting and persisting challenge in an era of rapid urbanization, digitalization, and population growth. And the first set of e-waste rules, they were notified in 2011, and they came into effect in 2012. And an important component of the rules of the earlier rules that were published in 2011 was the introduction of the extended producer responsibility. So under this, producers are responsible for the safe disposal of electronic and electric products once the consumer discards them. 
and e-waste rules 2016 which were amended in 2018 they were comprehensive and they included provisions to promote authorization and product stewardship so other categories of stakeholders uh, such as the producer responsibility organizations they were also introduced in these rules and apart from that in november 2022 the ministry of environment forest climate change it further notified a new set of e-waste rules so they will come into force from 1st of april 2023 and these rules they address some of the first main like they address some of the critical issues but they are silent on others so we'll be looking into all of that and the first main chapter of the EVs Management Rules 2022, it includes the provision of extended producer responsibility framework. Then the foremost requirement being the registration of the stakeholders, which includes the manufacturers, producers, refurbishers, and recyclers. And the earlier rules, they placed importance on seeking authorization by the stakeholders, but there was a weak monitoring system and lack of transparency that resulted in inadequacy in compliance. So now it is important for the stakeholders to get registered and most of the refurbishers or the repair shops operating in Delhi, they are not authorized under the Central Pollution Control Board of India. So you need to find out about the composition of it. So that is also an important thing for our awareness and further many formal recyclers they and they undertake activities only up to a pre-processing or segregation stage and thereafter they channelize e-waste to informal sector so this is a pure a violation of the law and a digitalized systems approach that is introduced in these new set of rules digitalized systems approach it may now address these challenges so standardizing the e-waste value chain through a common digital portal that may ensure transparency and it is crucial to reduce the frequency of paper trading or false trail that is a practice of falsely revealing 100% collection on paper while collecting or weighing scrap to meet the targets. So through this digitalized systems approach, we might be able to overcome the challenges that we were earlier facing. So we talked about this thing so this is number one and talking about myopic with the informal sector left out so basically these new rules they do not cover the informal sector so two most important stages of efficient e-waste recyclings recycling it includes component recovery that is adequate and efficient recoveries of rare earth metals in order to reduce our dependence on virgin resources and second is the residual disposal. So that is safe disposal of leftover residual during e-waste recycling. So the first component is you need to recover it. After that, ensure that the residue is properly disposed of. So the rules, they briefly touch upon the two aspects, but they do not clearly state the requirement for ensuring the recovery tangent. And therefore, in order to ensure maximum efficiency, the activities of recyclers that must be recorded in the system and authorities, they should periodically trace the quantity of e-waste that went for recycling vis-a-vis -vis the recovery towards the end. And the new notification, it also does away with the PRO and dismantlers and wests all the responsibility of recycling with authorized recyclers and they will have to collect a quantity of waste recycle them and then generate digital certificates through the portal and the informal sector which plays a crucial role in e-waste handling it draws no recognition in the new rules which could be on account of its illegality but the informal sector is the face of e-waste disposal in india as 95 percent of e-waste is channelized to the informal sector but informal sector is not being covered under the new set of rules Therefore, they also like hold immense potential to improve the state of e-waste management at the same time. So uh, when we talk about e-waste collection, segregation and recycling in, in the informal sector, it is the last stage that poses a major concern where e-waste is handed over to the informal dismantlers or recyclers. So in a case of uh, the rest of the stages, that does not involve any hazardous practices and that should be, uh, in fact, be strategically utilized for better collection of e-waste. For instance, when we talk about Karo Sambhav, 
uh, which is a Delhi based PRO. It has integrated the informal aggregators in its collection mechanism. So that's how this is one of the ways through which we can uh, involve the informal sector. And talking about the awareness, so many producers in Delhi, they are like have still not set up the collection centers and some brands have labeled their head office as the only collection point. So similarly, formal companies low in number and cluster in the metropolis, they also fail to provide doorstep collection to the consumers when the quantum of e-waste is not enough to meet their overhead expenses or transport. So on the other hand, consumers, they also lack awareness and information about the existence of any such services. And in order to ensure that there is efficient implementation of this law, stakeholders, they must have the right information and intend to safely dispose of the e-waste. So there is a need for simultaneous and consistent efforts towards increasing consumer awareness, strengthening the reverse logistics, building the capacity of stakeholders, improving the existing infrastructure, enhancing the product designing, rationalizing the input control, and adopting green procurement practices. So these are all solutions and all they like, have been put up in a uh, very simple and very like using less words, we're speaking more. So you can note them down at one place. And this should be supplemented by establishing a robust collection and recycling system on the ground, making it responsive to meet the legislative requirements. So this is an extremely important article and you can find out more that what else are the new set of rules that have been recently released. So democratically reimagining science, notwithstanding the origins of uh, India's National Science Day, which is to commemorate the discovery of the Raman effect, instead of speaking about the preeminent scientists and Nobel Prizes, it may be worthwhile to consider the absence of serious training in critiquing science. So there are two extremes, but we saw that in the resulting eagerness to steer clear of the pseudo-scientific blather, many have swung to the other extreme championing scientism and to the exclusion of other equally legitimate experiences of reality. So the adherents of these two extremes, they may claim to be far apart, but they are still united by their inability to imagine other better alternatives to a world in which science and non-science can only be at war. So science usefulness arises from the application of critical methods to produce the knowledge, but all the activities and events that follow, once such a knowledge is being produced, they are not necessarily scientific. Like uh, we do not have much important things to discuss over here, so let's move forward. So we see that there are relatively few tobacco users in the southern states and the share of smokers, it is declining in India, but smokeless tobacco consumption continues unabated. And so we will be like looking into this data, which is there from the National Family Health Survey 5 and 4 and 3 also. So only male smokers were considered as the share of women smokers was negligible across most of the states. So here uh, we are just talking about the male population. So this map, the map one is talking about the percentage of men who smoked cigarettes or BDs or cigars or pipe or hookah in 2019-21. So this is from the National Family Health Survey 5. And most of them are there in either in the northeastern states or in the north, like northern states. So that is there. And secondly, the map two is showing percentage of men who chewed gutka or with tobacco or pan masala with tobacco or pan with tobacco or keni. So this is more in northeastern states and in the central Indian states also. Map three is showing the share of male smokers who smoked more than five sticks a day. So again, more in some of the northeastern states than in Jammu and Kashmir Union Territory, apart from that in Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Goa, and in Kerala. So the number is high in these states.
and this table is showing the percentage share of people who smoked and chewed tobacco across the surveys. So smoke tobacco and chewed tobacco. So looking at the smoke tobacco and we saw that the share, it was like we're talking about the total share. So it was 32.7 percentage and over a period of time, it has been declining. So this is one thing. Apart from that, uh, comparing the urban and the rural smokers, we are again seeing a declining trend in both the regions, but the number is high in rural areas. And apart from that, when we talk about the chewed tobacco, even its share has been declining. And again, the share is more in rural areas. And in this case, we are seeing that for rural areas, the share has marginally declined in case of the chewed tobacco case. And in urban, it has been like declined by a significant amount. So India is likely to miss the deadline for half of the health SDGs. So the 75 percentage of Indian districts, they are off target for crucial SDGs indicators like poverty, stunting and wasting of children, anemia, child marriage, partner violence, tobacco use and contraceptive use. And the according to the study of the Lancet, India is not on target for over 50% of the indicators related to health for the 2030 deadline. So here in this case, you need to be aware about what are the SDGs specifically related to health. And then at the same time, you need to be aware about all the SDGs that we have. So talking about the new START treaty, which is on pause as of now, because recently we saw Russia has withdrawn from it. And it is basically a nuclear treaty that was signed between Russia and U.S. So talking about the history of it and what does this decision by the Russian president mean for the global arms control architecture and what does it mean for other nuclear powers? So on 23rd of February, we saw that uh, Russia basically withdrew from this new START treaty and so talking about what is this new START nuclear treaty so about half a decade before the end of the cold war the then leaders of US and erstwhile Soviet Union they declared in a historic statement a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought so both uh, Moscow and Washington they were aggressive in their one-upmanship of expanding the nuclear arsenal in the initial decades of the Cold War, and they have engaged in bilateral talks since then. And the first formal dialogue, the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks, which is SALT, it started between the two countries in 1969. And then the Anti-Ballistic Missile Defense Systems Treaty, which provided for the shooting down of the incoming missiles, it was signed in 1972. And then talking about START 1, so Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, START 1, it was signed in 1991. It expired in late 2009. And then another treaty, the Strategic Offensive Reductions Treaty, which is SORT, it was signed in 2002. So however, new START treaty, it replaced the 2002 pact. And it was the last remaining nuclear weapons control agreement between the two powers who together hold 90% of the world's nuclear arsenal. So almost 90% is held by Russia and USA together. And apart from that, so under this new START treaty, Russia and US exchange data twice a year on the ballistic missiles under the treaty's purview and on bombers, test sites, nuclear bases, etc. So they are exchanging the information twice in one year. And the treaty also mandates that the two parties to send notifications within five days if they change or if they update something in their stockpile. So the time period is five days and So both the parties, they were given seven years to reduce their stockpiles, including the nuclear warheads that are launched using the long range missiles, submarines and the bombers. And in 2018, both the nations, they also met the arms limit that was prescribed by this pact. 
and inspections under the treaty. However, they have stalled in the past three years. So there have been no inspections over the last three years. And they were first put on hold in 2020 owing to COVID-19. And after that, Moscow and Washington, they were due to discuss the restarting of inspections in November 2022. But this was postponed by Mr. Putin and there has been no development in this regard since then. So uh, the Russian president, he suspended the New START Treaty and obviously this is because of the NATO coming together to support Ukraine in the Russia-Ukraine war. So because of that, that is one of the reasons. So, so will it trigger an arms race now? So notably, since Mr. Putin, he has not withdrawn from the treaty and he has just suspended it, which is a term not defined in the official pact. Analysts, they are saying that the move would not immediately trigger an arms race, but the two powers and it could be a between the two powers and it could be a part of the Russia's political messaging amidst the West uh, massive assistance to Ukraine amid the year-long conflict between Russia and Ukraine and evidently the Russian administration also announced that it does not plan to breach the limits on the warheads which are prescribed in this New START treaty and apart from that what does the suspension mean for the global arms control? So following the suspension, the NATO Secretary General said that the move had made the world a more dangerous place, adding that with today's decision on new start, full arms control architecture has been dismantled. And observers, they say that the move uh, not only disturbs the fragile calculus of the nuclear arms controls between the two largest nuclear powers, but it could also give an opportunity to other nuclear armed countries, especially China and others like Pakistan, Iran, Israel, and India, among others, to increase their arsenals. And this is only going to make China even less interested in pursuing a cooperative nuclear security with the United Nations. And now even this last example of arms control cooperation is being seriously undermined. So these are some concerns and some fears related to this suspension of the treaty and organ on a chip. So a technology which mimics disease systems in laboratory conditions and researchers and biomedical companies in the West, they have started to build assemblies of different organ chips. So you can also have a look in this picture. How do they look? So these chips, they are small devices which are containing human cells that mimic the environment in human organs, which allow them to be used to test the new drugs. So this is a new development and the device for wound infection on chip has been set up so this is hair and the device which is set up with flow of media and cells present in the wound infection milieu so that's how the entire setup looks like so talking about the organ chips in india so a few research groups in india they have also been developing organ on chip models and a professor of pharmaceutical sciences and technology at the Institute of Chemical Technology, Mumbai, is an assistant here, and her group has developed a skin-on-chip model together with the team of Abhijit Majumdar, who is an associate professor of chemical engineering at IIT Bombay, and the model is currently being tested for studying skin irritation and toxicity. Two groups, they are also developing a retina-on-chip model together, so we are also seeing developments in India regarding this thing. And are they really ready to use or not? So some of these organ on chips that the Indian scientists, they have developed, they are ready for use as drug test beds in the lab settings. So some of them are ready. So researchers and biomedical companies in the West, they have started to build larger human on chip models, assemblies of different organ chips containing nutrients for the cells flowing across, mimicking the flow of blood and nutrients across different organs in the body. So here the idea is to predict the efficacy of a drug against a particular disease in the presence of messy organ interactions instead of cleanly isolated systems. So Italian Prime Minister Melanie is going to be the chief guest at 8 
eighth Rezina dialogue that we are going to host. And this is the first prime ministerial visit from Italy in five years. So bilateral defense cooperation agreement is likely to be announced that uh, will also have a framework for government to government deals. And so both the sides will take stock of the progress on the key outcomes of November 2020 summit, strengthen the security and defense cooperation, work towards closer economic ties, enhance the opportunity for mobility of talent, and give strategic guidance to ongoing collaboration in science and technology. So a joint statement at G20 meeting is unlikely. We're seeing growing confrontation between the Western countries and Russia. China combined is overshadowing the government's plans for the G20. And then the Rezina dialogue of the Ministry of External Affairs this week. So that's how we are seeing things are happening in the meetings and So the tensions which saw Russia and China come out publicly together on a multilateral stage for the first time since the war in Ukraine, it began, uh, which began in 2022 Feb, they are likely to be more pronounced at the Russian foreign ministers and Chinese foreign ministers uh, in Delhi for the inaugural reception uh, to be held at Rajpati Bhavan. And in Bali last July, the foreign ministers of the G7 countries, they boycotted the inaugural di uh, dinner session hosted by Indonesia. So there, like we have upcoming COARD and SEO meets. So meanwhile, a plan by the Modi government to host a meeting of COARD ministers and then which is going to be on the sidelines of the G20 meeting is also likely to ruffle feathers in the Chinese and the Russian camps. And in May this year, both Chinese and Russian foreign ministers, they are again expected to travel in India again to meet the SEO foreign ministers meeting, which is going to be there in Goa. So 1,300-year-old Buddhist stupa has been found in Odisha's Jajpur. And you can see in this picture, this is an initial assessment which showed that stupa could be 4.5 meters tall and it may belong to 7th or 8th century. And obviously, this has been done by the Archaeological Survey of India. So it is uh, an important role in such exercises. And... In Odisha's Jajpur district, where uh, we find the condolite stones, they were supplied for the beautification of the project around the 12th century Sri Jagannath Temple, which is there in Puri. And and there was another smaller stupa, uh, stupa which has been completely destroyed due to mining at the site. So uh, talking about the exact location, it is found at Parbhadi, which is situated near the Lalitgiri, which is a major Buddhist complex having a large number of stupas and monasteries. So after discovery of the Buddhist stupa from the mining site, ASI, it intervened and asked the Odisha government to stop mining through its Odisha Mining Corporation. And that is the thing. So... So these condolite stones, they were widely used in ancient temple complexes. And we also have Abhara, which is the augmentation of the basic amenities and development of heritage and architecture scheme. So Puri is being transformed into a world heritage site under the scheme.
So coming from the Supreme Court, history of invasions are dug up to keep the nation on the boil. So history of a nation cannot haunt the present and future generations so that succeeding generations, they become prisoners of the past and Hinduism is not really a religion and because of Hinduism being a way of life, India has assimilated everybody, whether invader or a friend. So it is not just a religion, it is a way of life in India. So India cannot remain a prisoner of the past with its history of invasions being constantly dug up and served on the plate of the present and the future generations to keep the country on the boil. And history of a nation cannot haunt the present and future generations of a nation so that succeeding generations, they become prisoners of the past. These observations, they were made while hearing a petition filed by a petitioner who sought a judicial direction to the Home Ministry to constitute a renaming commission to restore the ancient Hindu names of the historic and the religious places and roads across the country which were looted by barbaric, brutal, cruel invaders in the 15th century. So he said that the acts of barbaric invaders, they have like affected the citizens' right to sovereignty, unity, and integrity, and names from the uh, time of Ramayana and Mahabharata. They were changed during the foreign rule. So the petitioner wanted to restore the original names, and they have to be restored to protect our ancient culture. So the Supreme Court said that the petitioner, you know, basically it asked the petitioner to not be little Hinduism, which is a way, a way of life where there is no room for bigotry. And we were able to basically ass assimilate uh, whether it was an invader or a friend because uh, we were able to live together. So, so Justice Nagaratna, she said that British brought the, div the divide and rule policy, which caused a schism in the society. And let us not break it up again with such petitions. Have the country in mind and not the religion. So Karnataka is best equipped to supply renewable energy as per a report and... This is followed by Andhra Pradesh and Gujarat. As per the analysis by the Institute for Energy, Economics and Financial Analysis and Ember on Monday. So as part of its international obligations, India has committed to generate about half of its electricity from non-fossil fuel sources and reducing the emissions intensity of its GDP by 45% by 2030. So here you need to remember the targets that we have. And achieving this is predicted on states tweaking their infrastructure used to deliver electricity to efficiently accommodate inputs from multiple power sources, such as solar, wind, hydropower, and existing fossil fuel sources. Coming to the world page. So there is one more earthquake that struck Turkey and it killed, uh, basically it killed one and 69 were injured on the building collapse. So it was there in Malatya and it was measured by the European Mediterranean Seismological Center. So we discussed this entire topic in detail. Uh, and you can find that video. We covered this thing in newspaper analysis only which was very important article and it covered all important aspects. So South Africa has been placed on a watch list for financial crimes and FATF said that it had placed South Africa on the gray list for not stopping the money laundering, terror financing and proliferation of financing. So here you need to be know, uh, like you need to be aware about which all countries they are right now a part of the gray list and what are other types of list, which are there, and issued by FATF.
So bank credit growth slowed down to 16.8% in the third quarter as, by, uh, as per the RBI. And the public sector banks, they have increased their credit portfolio by 15.7%. Growth for the private sector banks remained higher at 19%. Current and savings deposits, they recorded a growth and deposit mobilization by the public sector banks improved to 8.8%. Private banks saw it at 13.2%. So coming to Mint here, we are looking into uh, is the global tax reform closer to reality now or not? So we have been uh, like earlier this topic was a uh, it was in news. So there was like reforms about the global tax architecture to stop cross border tax avoidance by the MNCs, and this is being discussed. So are they really close to getting it done or not? Is the important thing. So what does the global tax reform speaks about? So the idea is to stop the MNCs artificially shifting their profits from the country where their customers are to a low or a no tax country by exploiting the loopholes in the tax laws that are tailor made for a conventional brick and mortar industry. So this is right now, this is what they do to avoid tax paying. And the reform seeks to modify the regulatory architecture to prevent two things. So one is the arrangements by the MNCs to recognize the profits in the lowest tax jurisdictions and a race to the bottom by the individual governments to attract investments with the lower tax rates. So right now, 142 countries have agreed on this reform. And how is it being done? So the proposals, they are being negotiated. They have two pillars. The first one seeks to reallocate the part of the profits of the large MNCs above a specified threshold for taxation in countries where their customers are. And this would help the countries like India to get a slice of such profits through taxes. Second pillar is called the GLOBE proposal, which recommends a global minimum corporate tax rate of 50 15%. And ways to ensure that MNCs, they pay up this minimum level of tax on the income arising in each of the markets where they are operating. So it also proposes a top-up tax on profits in any market whenever the effective tax rate falls below the 15% level. So how will India benefit out of this? So pillar one is more relevant to India where large Western tech giants, they have a market and taxing rights on about uh, $200 billion in the global profits of the companies will boost our revenue. And the part will come to India will uh, replace its unilaterally imposed equalization levy on the online advertisements and e-commerce supplies by non-resident firms and receipts from the equalization levy that has, it has like never crossed even $1 billion a mark annually. So through this reform, definitely we'll be like expecting our revenues to increase. So is it really close to becoming a reality right now? So for it to become a reality, nations, they have to sign a legally binding multilateral convention and the G20 chair's outcome document issued on Friday, it said the world leaders, they will continue cooperation for a fair and modern tax system and that the treaty could be signed in the first half of this year. So what are the challenges to this reform? So given that work in the global tax reform, it started back in 2013, it remains to be seen how quickly the world leaders, they could sign a legally binding treaty on this and negotiations, they are still on record, uh, they are still on regarding the global minimum tax rate. So what should be the tax rate at the global level is still like not being finalized. So tax authorities and developing countries, they need to develop regulatory capacity for administering the complex tax rules. So will the bet on private investment pay off or not? So. The first graph is showing the high growth periods. They are usually linked to a surge in the private corporate investment. So you can see that whenever GDP was basically booming, 
we saw that the private corporate investment was also booming. So there's a direct relationship between the two. And as GDP is falling, we are seeing that the private corporate investment is also on a downside trend. So corporate investment, they drop during uncertain periods, obviously, because the situation is uncertain and there are no like future prospects about profits so the private investments they fall during such period so during like policy paralysis during great financial crisis of 2008-9 we saw that it declined by such a huge amount and then during COVID-19 we saw it plunged by like 16.4 percent So declining NPAs and less leveraged corporates they have eased the credit flows so this is one thing and uh, bank credit, it grew at an average year on year rate of 14%, but by itself, this augurs well for investment and but it assumes greater importance in the light of two developments that is significant corporate deleveraging and a reduction in banks non performing assets. So India faced a twin balance sheet problem between 2015 to 19, which originated from the credit funded investment boom between 2004 and 7. Unfortunately, the global financial crisis in 2008, it followed by a period of high commodity prices and rising interest rates that made it difficult for the corporates to repay their debt. So at, as the bad loans, they went up, banks, they were reluctant to lend Though there was like plenty of credit slack in the system, but obviously when there is increasing NPA, so even banks, they do not prefer to give credit so easily. So that was witnessed back then because of the situation, how it unfolded after the global financial crisis of 2008-9. Coming to Financial Express, so SkyMed predicts searing summer, so hot, hotter and hottest. We are expecting the summer to be like really hot and obviously to be worse compared to the previous year. So mercury levels to climb to record levels in April, May and June as per SkyMed. Persistent abnormal conditions to not be conducive for the farming sector. So obviously, if we'll be having such high temperatures, it would be impacting our food production and definitely then inflation would be on the rise. So that is a huge concern for us. And then standing rabi crop, especially wheat and the horticulture that may be adversely impacted because of this. So higher day temperatures prevailing in some parts of the country unlikely to recede soon, according to IMD as well. So this is one of the major concerns for us this year. Adani stocks still falling. So flyers in Hawaii chapels, the prime minister says that those wearing the Hawaii chapels, they should travel in Hawaii jahaz. And I'm seeing uh, it happening in the coming days. India will need thousands of aircrafts and days of made in India passenger aircraft. They are also not far away. So move to improve the audit quality. Auditors of the top firms to store the records in entity digi locker. So the proposed entity digi locker is also likely to be used to improve the audit quality of top tier companies and the National Financial Reporting Authority is planning to ask the auditors of these top firms to use this facility. So an auditor may be allowed to collect all documents needed for the audit in advance and store them in entity digi locker. So we are like we also have our Aadhaar card information stored in digi lockers. So that's how basically like things would not be manipulated if the data is stored here. But again, then data safety is a question mark. So kept national interest on top while importing cheaper fuel coming from a finance minister. So with the Russia-Ukraine conflict driving up the global commodity prices, India chose to import the cheaper fuel from Russia and other available sources in order to protect the country's interest. 
And in order to protect the farmers against the steep rise in the international prices, the government also had to more than double the budgetary allocation for the fertilizer subsidies back then. So we did not come under any pressure. We made sure that the affordable fuel came to India. So we took decisions which put India's interest on top. And we have been like discussing also how India's share of imported crude oil from Russia, mm -hmm. it grew massively after the Russia-Ukraine war. And so this the share has now increased up till 28% as of January this year. So 5G services have been come up in few areas. And India's chip market is going to hit $55 billion by 2026 as per Deloitte. So the country's semiconductor market is expected to reach $55 billion by 2026 on the back of growing demand from the smartphones and wearables, automotive components and computing and data storage sectors. So there is like huge scope when we talk for the semiconductors in India. Coming to the editorial, the opinion section, keeping an eye on China. So there is no evidence that Z is supporting Russia's Ukraine invasion so far. However, indirectly, they are supporting Russia in this war. And Joe Biden says that I had a long conversation with Z about this. And I said, look, this is not a threat. When Europeans and Americans saw what was happening, 600 corporations pulled out of Russia. So then they didn't want to be associated with all of this. So that is one thing. So many artificial intelligence systems, they are designed to make decisions based on the preferences of multiple individuals. And Arrow's theorem suggests that there are inherent limitations to that. So India hasn't gained much from its free trade agreement deals with countries like South Korea. And like we have right now, uh, we have been signing FTAs with different countries. So the Union Commerce Minister Piyush Goyal, he reportedly said on Saturday that Korean auto giants Hyundai and Kia they, uh, has cost India billions of dollars in trade deficit with Korea and other nations. So the minister attributed this to the free trade agreement with South Korea, which allowed them to import indiscriminately. So even without a specific focus on the auto giants imports into India, it can be argued that the country hasn't gained much from its comprehensive economic partnership agreements with South Korea. And over the past six years, India trade deficit with South Korea has averaged at around $10 billion, so which is basically doubling from a deficit of roughly $5 billion in financial year 2010. So there's no denying that some of the import growth can be attributed to essential goods which are not produced or assembled in India due to insufficient or absent capacity. But there has been a spurt in non-essential imports as well at the same time. And auto majors, even Indian, Indian ones also, they tend to stick to their network of suppliers while there could have been substitution in India. But this, is, this has not really happened and we have depended more upon imports. So uh, even as India works the renegotiation tightrope, it must have clarity on many aspects. So the first one is it needs to comprehensively art articulate what it wants from these trade deals and what its non-negotiables are. So services exports, which India could have been leveraged to offset any deficit in competitiveness of its merchandise exports, remain a sticky point in the FTAs with ASEAN as uh, also in Indian India's FTA talks with the UK. So what was done with the diplomatic interest in mind must be corrected keeping the economic interest at the center. 
So also trade pragmatism calls for letting the industry decide from whom to procure while taking into account every little concern and opportunity it flags with respect to the FTA negotiations. And to that end, the government has done well to have extensive industry and other stakeholder consultations before it sits at the FTA table, uh, and which is a marked change from the vintage FTAs. So how to regulate the digital assets, lawmakers and regulators, they could avoid prospective micromanagerial mandates and enforce principle-based rules to balance the prudence and innovation and let regulatory tools evolve as the market develops. So digital asset markets exhibit the same risk as traditional finance markets. Therefore, the existing regulatory toolkit may suffice. So it would be an understatement to say that the policy discourse surrounding the appropriate regulatory policy for Web3 technologies is polarizing. So here, firstly, you need to be clear with the idea of Web3. And it is heartening that at the Bengaluru meeting of the finance ministers of G20, they have recognized the need for a globally coordinated principle-based approach to address the issue of regulations of private digital assets like cryptocurrencies. So we also have the blockchain technology that has arrived on the financial markets firmament and bring in the potential for benefits as well as risks. So India's G20 presidency, it offers us a unique opportunity to shape the future of digital assets regulation, both in India and at the global level, by creating a facilitative legal and regulatory architecture in concrete terms, which can be adopted globally. Coming to Indian Express, let's see what important things do we have. So multiple governments since 1990s, they have unsuccessfully attempted to allow the entry of foreign varsities into mm -hmm. India. Mm -hmm. And the idea is now coming to fruition with the entry of Deakin, which will like start its operations next year. So Australia's University of Wollongong is also expected to follow suit. So we are going to expect entry of Australian universities into India. And this is obviously with uh, coming of the new education policy of 2020. So directly jumping onto the editorials page where we have the most important information and things to be discussed. So if you want to control someone, all you have to do is to make them feel afraid. So arresting Mr. Sisodia and CBI needs to insulate due process from 2024 politics and AAP needs a better defense than outrage. So this statement completely fits into this issue and the situation in Punjab is obviously volatile with, we are seeing rising a few elements, volatile elements which are associated with raising the demands for Khalistan. And Pakistan fished uh, in troubled waters in 1980s, and we cannot allow repetition now. So is the police capable of dealing with the situation which is unfolding in Punjab? Then certainly, yes, it is. And it is this very police that went hammer and tongs against the terrorists in Punjab and it vanquished them. So they had a clear political direction to wipe our terrorism and they had excellent police officers who led from the front. So the state government of Punjab has unfortunately been fiddling with the police and there have been four director generals of police in the state since September 2021 itself and what functional autonomy they had and what directions were given to them in dealing with such extremist elements is anybody guess because we saw that the newer ones coming up so quickly 
So the a grim reality, however, is that in matters of security, Punjab cannot be equated with the hinterland states. So we have seen how Pakistan fished in the troubled waters of Punjab in 1980s, and we cannot allow a repetition of that. So uh, here, uh, obviously, you need to be like aware about at least the political situation, which was back then in 1980s, and uh, also about the Operation Blue Star. Then problem will have to be nipped in the bud internally as well as externally, and even if some unpleasant decisions have to be taken. So the, if the state government does not show the political will to tackle the problem head on, it may as well be dismissed and the president's rule may be imposed in the state if situation gets more worse in the state. So the strong governor, a strong governor will have to be sent with a team of competent advisors. And we cannot take any risk or even chances in Punjab. So considerations of the national security, they must override all other factors. So a uh, stable capital flows, they can help the country finance its current account deficit. So here, because globally we are seeing increase in the policy rates, we are seeing a huge amount of capital outflow. So obviously that is adding up to the pressure on current account and then also adding up to the pressure upon the Indian rupee because because of that, the Indian rupee depreciates, which makes our imports much more costlier, but at the same time, it also makes our exports more competitive. So as per the RBS quarterly statistics, the current account deficit, it widened to 4.4% of the GDP in second quarter of 2022-23, which was down from 2000, which was down from 2.2% in the preceding quarter. So this marks a reversal from an unusual surplus of 0.9% of GDP, which we saw in 2020-21. Obviously, that was because of COVID-19. And in the third quarter of this financial year, while the merchandise trade deficit that has also widened, the current account deficit may witness a fall. So the overall trade deficit, it has declined to $37.73 billion dollars. In the third quarter, from around $49.1 billion in the second quarter. So at the overall level, we are seeing that current account deficit has fallen. But the latest statistics, they also reveal a sharp decline in the trade deficit to $1.27 billion in January on the back of significant rise in net services exports. So we are seeing that there might be a sharp decline in trade deficit because we saw a sharp and a significant rise in net services exports. So is the current account deficit a cause of concern for us or not? So the answer is not that straightforward to this question. And India's current account deficit, it has like both desirable and undesirable components. So a desirable deficit is a natural reflection of rising investment, portfolio choices, and the demographics of the country. However, large and persistent current account deficits can be undesirable if they reflect bigger problems such as poor export competitiveness and they are financed by unstable financing. So the counter-cyclical nature of India's current account deficit is a matter of concern and Research by Ashima Goel, C. Rangarajan, and Prachi Mishra, they suggest that the country's current account deficit rises when output falls rather than when demand rises, indicating the dominance of external shocks. So I would repeat that the country's current account deficit, it rises when output is falling rather than when demand rises. So... This indicates dominance of external shock. So we are vulnerable to external shocks as far as current account deficit is concerned. For instance, if oil prices, they rise and as oil is an input in the production process, it raises the cost of production and it leads to a fall in the economic growth. So that's how things basically work uh, through a chain and in this case, current account deficit that rises with the falling growth due to both the inelasticity of the oil import demand as well as its major share in India's total imports. So obviously the demand is inelastic as far as the oil imports are concerned because that is one of the, we can say, the main thing that is used almost everywhere, be it the transportation or in certain manufacturing industries also. So we cannot be like if the prices are increasing, so we can like reduce uh, or we can like import less of crude oil. So that, that's why the demand is inelastic in this case. Inelastic basically in the context of is the changes in its price. So large and persistent current account deficits that expose India to the risk associated with its 
financing. And economic theory suggests that if current account deficits can be financed by stable capital inflows, such as FDI inflows, they are desirable as they are less prone to capital flights. So if we have our current account deficits financed through FDI inflows, that is sought to be much more desirable and stable thing instead of, you know, financing it through FBI inflows because FBI inflows, they are much more volatile and not that obviously we know that the main difference between FDI and FBI is that their duration. So however, if deficits, they are financed by volatile capital flows, such as the portfolio flows, they um, there may be a cause of concern then. And portfolio flows, they are capricious and they're more susceptible to reversals in case of any global financial shock. So if we have more of FBI inflows in the country and suppose there is any global financial shock, so they can like easily exit from the Indian economy or from the Indian market, which becomes a concern for us. So hence the composition of financial financing it is crucial. And while FDI inflows they were enough to finance the deficit in 2021-22, these flows inflows they have been weak in the current fiscal year. So we saw FDI falling and FDI and portfolio inflows each they only financed about 18% of the current account deficit in the second quarter. So there is a financing issue when we're talking about current account deficit financing. And remittances and services exports, they have provided a counterbalance to the rising mercantile trade deficits that we are witnessing. And India's services exports, they grew at 23.5 percentage in 2021-22. And so our services exports are performing really nicely. So while capital flows, they are pro-cyclical and react negatively to contractionary monetary policy by the Fed, Remittances, they have exhibited remarkable stability and over the medium term, the policymakers, they need to arrest the negative spillovers from the slowdown in the global trade and the merchandise exports. So further rate hikes by the US Fed may lead to capital outflows, leading to additional exchange rate market pressures. This could be challenging in the current situation as a weaker currency coupled with a sticky import basket will lead to imported inflation. So this is very important for you to understand the whole mechanism that if there would be more capital outflows from the Indian economy, Indian rupee would depreciate. And if it's like if it depreciates, then our imports, they become much more expensive. And since few items, they are inelastic in their demand. So that would be leading to imported inflation. And that's how this becomes a concern, concern for the Indian economy. That's why we are saying that when we are talking about the current account deficit financing, it should be financed majorly by FDI and not FPI inflows. So India is currently facing twin deficit problem of high fiscal deficit and high current account deficit. So this situation is called twin deficit problem. So deficit at two fronts, and while aggressive fiscal consolidation may be undesirable in the face of rising fears about a global slowdown, a comfortable external environment can be maintained by ensuring stable financing along with using exchange rates as a shock absorber to weather the adverse global economic situation. So that's all for today. Thank you for joining in Sarkari. I hope you have enjoyed the session and understood it really well. And you'll be getting the PDF link in the description box also. So that is also important and apart from that do not forget to subscribe to our channel hit the like button and share this video as much as possible thank you so much for joining us